action, language, um, uh, location, because frankly, the hospital that they're in may not be the close to the long-term care facility that they want to be located in. So all of those pieces together are going to be part of the conversations that are happening literally individually, patient by patient, in hospitals. If you can't put a hard number on it, can you at least express like what actual impact is this going to have on the hospital system? Yeah, well, we're, we're very hopeful and confident that we are going to be getting able we are going to be able to have uh, 400 alternative level of care patients placed in community. But I don't want to put a hard number on it because the conversations with families have to happen first and those matching uh, opportunities need to be part of the conversation to make sure that families' needs and patients' needs are respected. And that's what we're, we will be doing with our hospital partner. And on, on language preferences, uh, the regulation says they're going to be respected. Does that guarantee that a francophone patient will not be transferred in an anglophone center, or is that just a preference? So, uh, I'll, I'll let you speak. Yeah, so the guidance document that we are working uh, on, uh, which will form a part of this, uh, will obviously include uh, uh, language, it'll include uh, 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 cultural uh, uh, um, uh, considerations. So there's a whole, no, a whole host of things that will be considered in this. Uh, obviously, our, our, our First Nations homes, four of our First Nations homes, will be uh, exempted from uh, from this uh, as well. So there will be a number of considerations that are put in place that will be presented to the uh, to the resident uh, or to the patient uh, as they're able to make uh, uh, as they're able to make their choice. But as you can appreciate, and there are some parts of the province where we might not have a, a specific a bed available for somebody. Uh, uh, in uh, that can match that criteria. But that is why we've done the radius the way that we've done it, to put the maximum amount of uh, options in front of somebody and where we can. Obviously, uh, the coordinators who are going to be uh, uh, helping with this will ensure that that, uh, that, 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 gets, uh, that that gets done. So, look, as, as, as Minister Jones has said, this, this is, is actually something that uh, the province has, been, uh, has had on the table for many, many years. And you've heard me say in the House, uh, on many, many, many occasions, long-term care can be part of a solution for the first time in decades. For the first time in decades, we're able to be part of a solution for uh, alternative level of care. It is about respite care. Those people who have sent their loved ones to a hospital because they just needed time out. They needed a chance, uh, a break. Those options were closed to them. This policy allows them, uh, uh, allows us to get back to doing that. Uh, so it, it is a, it is a, it, great transformation that I think will really help uh, not only the hospital system but will be better for the patient in the long run as well. Yeah, so if I may, I'd like to give a very real example because you raise, um, you know, why why this cannot be cut and dry policies. The, the availability of a francophone bed may trump the patient's interest in being close to their loved ones. So these are why the care coordinators have such an important role having those conversations with family. What is more important? Do you want to have the your loved one close to you so that you can visit on a regular basis? Or is it more important for your loved one, because perhaps they have dementia, to have care offered in their first language? These are the conversations that are literally going to go on one one family by one family through the hospital system. And it will take time, but we want to make sure that the patient's needs are looked after. And frankly, an alternative level of care patient in a hospital that is built and operating to look after acute care patients is not a good fit. So we want to make this work for the patient to ensure that those alternative level of care uh, beds are actually available for acute patients who need the, the assistance. Can you guys clarify what, what's the center point of this radius? Is it the hospital I'm in? Is it the home I chose? Where, 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 where's the radius start? Yeah, so it, it, actually very good question. So it will be a, a, it, it'll be the home that you've chosen so or your home address. It just depends what information is made available to us. And uh, so if you've selected a home, uh, we will look within a 75 kilometer radius uh, or 70 kilometer radius, excuse me, of the home that you've selected. If we do not have that, other, that information, then it'll be of the hospital. But it is, uh, it's an opportunity for us to look at, look, what are the preferences? Because obviously we want to keep you as close as possible to the home that you've selected as your preference while you're waiting 
uh, in, on the list, frankly, to get into that home. Uh, but as, as we've said, providing the most amount of, uh, of, of options uh, to, to the patients. So it is from their, uh, from, uh, uh, in most circumstances, it will be from their home of, uh, of uh, first choice. Now, when, when the bill came out, uh, people said, look, old, <coughs> frail, elderly people are going to be forced to go hundreds of kilometers away and they're going to be forced to do it with the threat of hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, whatever, in fines. You're telling me today that that is the case, but the people who said that, you said they were fear-mongering. Do you take that back now? Uh, what uh, I said is that we would do everything in our power to make sure that people stay close to home. And I'm, I'm actually very passionate about that. I'm glad you raised that question because we didn't hear that uh, uh, that massive amounts of options would be provided to people. What we heard is that people would be sent from Windsor uh, to northern Ontario or for northern Ontario thousand kilometers away to the south and I had said right from the beginning that that is not the case what we have done here today the uh, the recommendations the regulations that we have brought forward not only keep people closer to home the it ensures that there is a multitude of options that are presented to the patient in long-term care so that they can make that choice it keeps them closer to their first home of choice it puts them it keeps them at the top of the uh, of uh, of their of the waiting list for their preferred home, it gives them a better quality of care. It keeps them closer to their family. It keeps them closer to their partners, their loved ones, uh, and it gives them, as we said, a better quality of care closer to home. And respects the fact that somebody might not necessarily want to be in the home that they're placed in, but they will stay at the top of the waiting list for their home of preferred choice. So it is not the thousand kilometers the, uh, that many report. I think you yourself reported that it would be eighteen hundred dollars a day. It's not $1,800 a day. It's not 1,000 kilometers away. It's not northern Ontario going to southern Ontario. It's close to home, close to the people that you love. It's a better quality of care, and it is a transformation of the system that the people of this province have been asking for, our hospitals uh, have been asking for, our doctors have been asking for, uh, for, uh, for decades. Minister, Minister, other question of, on the question of consent. These, uh, what these fees and distances disproportionately affect the poor and the vulnerable? So the fee is to have that very challenging conversation that the discharge planners will be having with families. We want to have a clear understanding that the bed needs to be for acute care patients. Those conversations include, yes, we will need to charge if you refuse to take the, the long-term care bed that we have found for you. That part is to frankly make sure that people understand a hospital bed is for an acute patient. It is not for a long-term care patient. There is no social programming in our hospitals, nor should there be, because they are for acute patients. We have the social programming. We have the congregate uh, dining opportunities. We have all of those things in homes called long-term care homes. So we want to make sure that people who are going through their journey and are no longer in need of acute care help, assistance, in our hospitals are moved to a more appropriate setting. Are and in many cases, that is long-term care. Are you worried about the people who won't be able to afford, say, driving 70 kilometers or driving 150 kilometers as caregivers, you know, to visit their loved ones? So again, this is why the care coordination and the dispatch, the discharge planners are going to be so important. You know, in my own family, we have seven children. So we don't all live in the same community. As we decide who is going to be the primary caregiver for our elderly, for our loved ones, we make those conversations and we have those conversations with our healthcare practitioners, with our family members to say where and who is in the best place to have mom or dad looked after. It may be in the community they have lived all their life. It may be in a community where their um, daughter, son are, are more closely able to, to be there as part of that social interaction. But all of those conversations have to happen in order for us to have to give the opportunity and give the choices to people. And we will do that. At the end of the day, if someone refuses after we have found an appropriate long-term care home bed, then there will be a charge laid by the hospital. And the hospitals, as they do with every other um, example where they have to charge people, they will do the follow-up, they will do the billing, they will do the invoicing. Uh, Mr. Jones, the latest stats from the uh, Health Quality Ontario is still showing 
record long wait times in emergency for or, or for patients who were admitted from emergency uh, to, to uh, get a bed on the ward. You've said yourself that a big reason for that is these alternate level of care patients, right? That are taking up beds. So when are we going to, are we going to, what kind of an impact are we going to see? Are people going to see in the hospital system of these changes? Are we going to actually even notice the, the, um, any, in, any improvement in people's access to, uh, to hospital beds? Well, frankly, I, I think that those conversations have already started. We've talked about how when there, there is almost 30% of the patients in a particular hospital who are um, alternative level of care, which means they're not getting regular care provided by the hospital because they are stabilized, because they are ready for the next stage. If we have the ability to offer and move those individuals into more appropriate placements, like long-term care, then that is going to, exactly to your point, free up those hospital beds so that people who are waiting for admission can get into a hospital bed and get the acute care that they need. This is all part of what we have announced um, a number of months ago. Five point plan to make sure that our hospitals have the capacity to look after individuals who need it in for acute care. We don't have, we don't build hospitals to house long-term care beds. We build long-term care homes for that. And there's a reason why one is called a hospital and one is called a home. Long-term care homes offer a different opportunity for the patients, and that includes social interaction that you do not see in a hospital because that is not their prime function. Minister, on that data that Mike was talking about, it takes about 20, on average, 20.7 hours to get from the ER into a hospital bed. It's shorter, actually, to drive from Toronto to Florida than it is to actually get a, a bed in an Ontario hospital. Those numbers have been getting worse since 2018 when hallway health care was a major election issue. Where are we seeing the ceiling here? Are you expecting that number to continue to get worse? Or is this bill or any other measure that your government is taking going to blunt that number sometime soon? Well, I think government's role is to prepare and plan. And we've done that. We've done that with historic expansions in long-term care bed uh, expansions across Ontario. We've done that to make by building, I think we have 49 different hospital expansions that are happening in the province of Ontario. So we're planning for the future. We're planning for as individuals get older, as our population grows. But in the meantime, we also have to acknowledge that there are hospital beds that could be and should be used for acute patients and not for alternative level of care patients. Is there an Why acceptable wait this, time? Why? Is there an acceptable wait time for you um, for a patient to get to, once they enter the ER to actually get in a hospital bed. The average right now is 20 hours and 20.7 hours. Is there an acceptable uh, number for you in your mind? So again, hospital by hospital, clini clinician by clinician, it depends on what that person is coming into the emergency department for. But these are all the conversations and the, the feedback that we're receiving from our hospital partners. If we can deal with a percentage of the alternative level of care patients in the province of Ontario, it will give us some flexibility and frankly, the ability to admit people sooner when those beds are available. That is exactly why Bill 7 has been put in place and it is exactly why we need to make sure that we do this carefully, have those conversations with family, have them understand that that loved one will be better served in a long-term care home because it is a home, not a hospital. Just a few months ago, you ran on building hospital beds. Why didn't you tell seniors that they would be spending $12,000 a month in hospital if they refused to take a long-term care bed that was not their choice? So again, again, I will say for decades, hospitals in Ontario have had the right to bill patients who uh, were alternative level of care and were not accepting other options. Uh, that practice has been in place in the province of Ontario for decades. What we are doing now with our regulation is making the dollar value consistent so that no matter which hospital you are in, if you have refused the offer of a long-term care bed, you will be charged on a, on a uh, daily basis $400. How many so, is this clear? More guys? 
You did. Sorry, how many Why didn't you run on it? Minister? Why didn't you tell voters yeah. ahead of time, just a few months ago, that you were planning this? You know, I, I respectfully cannot think of anything that we talked about more during the campaign than the ability to expand our health care capacity in long-term care, in hospital, in community. We've done that. Our most recent budget had a billion dollar investment on community care because we understand that not every ALC patient is going to need to go into a long-term care bed. They may be able to, with sufficient supports, um, be able to uh, live at home with supports. That only happens because our most recent budget had a billion dollar investment in community care. We've done as I said, the work in planning and preparing, and we're going to continue to do that with um, policies like First Bed and Bill 7. How many Minister, beds? Minister, there, COVID showed us one thing, that there's some horrible operators out there where people actually died in their long-term care bed. I wouldn't want to go there for any reason at all. Are you going to start forcing people that of these long-term care facilities that still don't have air conditioning, um, have a horrible reputation, are you going to start forcing patients into there or elderly people into those type of situations? Uh, uh, look, first let's let's uh, let's be very clear. Uh, uh, I, I won't uh, disagree with you that uh, we inherited a system that was not prepared uh, to handle uh, COVID. Uh, the previous government had built uh, uh, previous two liberal administrations, I think, invested in about 611 long-term care beds province-wide. Most ridings, in fact, most every riding in this province has more than that uh, uh, being built or being planned uh, uh, locally, uh, frankly. But the Fixing Long-Term Care Act uh, uh, not only increases uh, uh, the level of care to four hours, uh, four hours a day, it also is adding 27,000 additional health care workers throughout the long-term care system, 58,000 uh, uh, new and upgraded beds across the system. Every part of this province, north, south, east, west, urban, rural, remote, is getting access to a long-term care home that they didn't have before. To your point, we're building homes in the Francophone community that never existed before. We're building homes for uh, uh, Indo -Canadian com the Indo-Canadian community in, uh, uh, in Brampton. We've also doubled the amount of inspectors uh, uh, in uh, in the long-term care system. We have the highest inspector-to-home ratio in North America. We have the highest level of care uh, with uh, four hours of care uh, in uh, in North America. Uh, we are 90% of our way, if not more now, on our way to having every single long-term care room in the province of Ontario air conditioned, something that two years ago was not even on the radar of anybody. 15 years of previous Liberal government, they never talked about uh, uh, air conditioning. Uh, so there is so much. And the reason I'm excited about this policy, frankly, is because I keep saying, it is, it's about, you talk about what did we run on? We were very clear back in 2018 and 19 that we were going to be bringing in Ontario health teams, a blanket of care, uh, and that we were building an integrated health care system. And that's what this is a transition to. It is about continuing that path. It is about honoring the investments that have been made over $15 billion worth of investments in long-term care. Fifteen billion dollars and we are ensuring that all homes, whether it's uh, municipal, not-for-profit or a private, all have the highest standard of care. It shouldn't matter where you are, your standard of care should be the same and the Fixing Long-Term Care Act has done that and the investments that we've put in place in rebuilding uh, those homes, getting rid of the three and four uh, uh, ward rooms, increasing the inspectors, the four hours of care, all helps us ensure that across the board, regardless of where you are, you have the same high quality care. Minister you, yeah. Minister, you indicated that patients would not be coerced, but the option you're giving them once they're placed into a long-term care home is, hey, you've been discharged, leave the hospital, or you could face a $400 fine or fee, daily fee. How is that not, in your view, both of you, how is that not coercion? Well, I'll start with you're on the priority list. So yes, your treatment in hospital has finished. You are no longer in need of acute care. You're an alternative level of care patient. Now, we have, through the care coordination piece, went out and after talking to the family, found out where your preferred area location is, where your preferred uh, long-term care homes are, uh, whether there are other uh, factors working with the home, like do you need bariatric 
care? Do you need behavioral issues because your loved one happens to be a dementia patient who wanders? All of those pieces together, the care coordinator will then present to the family and the patient, here are the beds that we have found within your preferred parameters. When and if and only if, after those conversations have happened, does someone refuse, does the $400 um, come in? Because you have to acknowledge that's that, hosp that's, that, that, that hospital that beds are not long-term care beds. But how, how is that not coercion? You're, so, you're telling them, we found a home for you. You're being evicted from the bed. You're either going to face a fee if you want to stay in this bed, uh, or you have to go to the home. How is that not coercion? How is it? It, we, we are making sure that you are most appropriately placed. And that appropriate place is not an acute care facility where you no longer are in need of acute care. Now, I want to be clear, alternative level of care patients are not just seniors and elderly who are going to long-term care. There are individuals waiting for rehabilitation. There are individuals who are waiting to go home with appropriate uh, renovations. And, you know, M Minister Calandra didn't mention it, but we as a government have, always, have also made investments there. So seniors who, are, who want to renovate their home have some assistance from the provincial government to make sure that as long as you can live in your home safely, we will empower you to do that and we will give you those supports. But at the end of the day, hospitals are for acute care patients. They're not for alternative level of care patients waiting for a long-term care bed. What, what if the long-term care homes in COVID outbreak? 